we are extremely fortunate to have with us here in California today three Chief Justices who have served uh, on their respective state Supreme Courts for a total of 65 years. That's impressive. That's impressive. Uh, all three inform me that they started just after the age of majority, uh, and, uh, w w which explains the total number of years. But more seriously, they are recognized and were, were invited to participate in this program as three of the most informed and thoughtful state judges in the country uh, on this particular subject. Uh, each of the Chief Justices, according to our plan, will discuss a separate aspect of the topic uh, for 15 minutes, which I shall uh, respectfully, of course, it goes without saying, uh, attempt to enforce. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we begin uh, first uh, with Justice Thomas Moyer of the Supreme Court of Ohio. Secondly, Chief Justice Tom Phillips, uh, retired Chief Justice of the State of Texas, and Justice Christine Durham of the Supreme Court of Utah. Justice Moyer. Thank you, and thank you to uh, the Dean and to the faculty and all those who are responsible for organizing uh, this um, first, uh, first conference on the judiciary in California. I'm pleased to be back. Uh, I came here uh, for several reasons. Uh, look outside, and that's one reason I came from Ohio. Um, <laughs> I also thought that uh, after the number of uh, election cases we had filed in the Ohio Supreme Court, because Ohio, of course, was one of those, those um, states in which the votes were close, I was free of that, and I could come to California and not worry about it. Well, I'm, we're starting late because, indeed, we have a case filed, a provisional ballot case affecting a, a very close uh, uh, seat, a race for Congress, and so I apologize that, that uh, we are starting late. Uh, I know I speak for, for Tom and, and Christine, in saying uh, we, uh, we enjoy being in the home state of Ron George, our good friend, Chief Justice Ron George. You know him here as a very, very progressive uh, Chief Justice. I've been extremely impressed with his, uh, the changes you've made in the system here. Uh, but we know him as um, a colleague, a counterpart, who, uh, who comes together with us t at least twice a year uh, in our meetings, in which we discuss very important issues. All the chiefs get together. And Ron, of course, Ron George, of course, is, is always uh, one who, to whom we listen. Uh, he has uh, been a past president of our association, and, and it's just a pleasure to be, uh, to be here with, uh, with Ron, with Chief Justice George. Thank, thank you, Ron. Um, my, I think my role here is to, um, is to dig a deep, dark hole, and then uh, Tom Phillips will probably dig it a little deeper, but Christine Durham has the wonderful opportunity to sort of dig us out of it, uh, at least part way. Uh, state Supreme Courts are uniquely positioned, certainly, to address the complex issues that our society brings to uh, the judiciary, making conferences such as this very, very extremely important. I, I don't think there ever, can ever be too many of these kinds of conferences where we focus on um, this uh, wonderful heritage we have in this country of fair and impartial courts. That's the expectation of our citizens. The role of the courts is necessarily, though, intertwined with a conversation about how do we select uh, the judges in our state courts, and there's quite a variety, a wide variety of, of selection processes. Contested judicial campaigns across the United States in 2008 continue to be costly and in many ways very negative, raising grave concern that the political pressures typically reserved for the other two branches of government uh, their, for their campaigns, that, that they have become a part of campaigns for um, uh, those of us, the judiciary, who are supposed to be fair and impartial, and of course not responding to, uh, uh, responsive to any other influences than facts and, and law. Well, preliminary campaign spending statistics from the most recent state Supreme Court races, there, tw there were 23 in, uh, seats in 13 states in 2008, indicate that more money was spent on campaign advertising in 2008 than in the previous campaign cycle, which was 2006. Almost $5 million was spent uh, on television advertising in Supreme Court races just in the last week before the elections, according to preliminary, st these are preliminary st statistics from the Brennan Center for, for Justice. Overall, $17 million was spent this year in state Supreme Court races. Again, that's a bit of an estimate based upon the money that reports so far. 
Um, before I continue, I, I, I should point out that I serve as a board member of the Justice at Stake campaign, which many of you know is an independent, nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit Washington-based organization that monitors judicial campaigns. It's probably the, the premier um, entity that, in our country that does that now because of their ability to research and assist states that, that want to reform or at least change their, their, their selection processes. So many of the statistics to which I will refer uh, are, are uh, from uh, justice at stake. The increased spending in judicial races is used to fund television ads primarily, uh, no surprise, that often are overly personal and political, obviously causing citizens to question whether either candidate who's in the race will be able to um, fulfill their constitutional role being fair and impartial. In Michigan, uh, this is probably the number one race this year to make the example. Chief Justice Clifford Taylor was defeated after the Democrat Party aired ads accusing him of falling asleep. They had an actor uh, portray this during oral arguments and of being a good soldier for big business. He also was accused of voting to prevent women from suing employers for sexual harassment and sexual assaults. His challenger, Diane Marie Hathaway, was the target of ads, accusing her of being soft on crime, sexual predators, and terrorists. That's quite a group. Um, on one attack, ad used the image, image of what appeared to be an Arab holding an assault rifle uh, and accused her of giving probation to a terrorist. In Mississippi, the Chief Justice and two incumbent justices were all defeated uh, in last week's election. Chief Justice Jim Smith was defeated after ads accused him of siding with major corporations. The other two justices were defeated by opponents who had the backing of the Chamber of Commerce. In a race earlier this year, uh, West Virginia, I'm, most of you probably have read about the West Virginia saga, uh, Justice Elliot Maynard was defeated in a primary after ads appeared uh, that, prod that parodied the old version, uh, old television show, rather Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, of course they depicted him, had actual film of him, video of him on the French Riviera having a good time with uh, the party who had won a case by a 3-2 vote. He voted, he voted in the majority, uh, multi-million dollar case, and there he was afterwards with, uh, with the, the, the president of the company. Um, the sequel to this is very interesting because I think, it's, I think it's the first time this argument's been made in the U.S. Supreme Court. It's being made by Ted Olson, who is seeking to remove another justice on the same court in the same case uh, because he received about $3 million in contributions from that same person. And Ted Olson's argument is that that, it, that violates due process. There is a point at which the level of contributions is so high in a judicial race that it violates the due process rights of, of the other party in the case. Wisconsin holds its judicial elections in the spring, and that's when incumbent Lewis Butler was defeated after ads falsely accused him of using a loophole to free a rapist from prison. Justice Butler and his challenger combined to raise $1.2 million, a fraction of the $4.8 million spent by the unaffiliated groups. Now, I prefer to un unaffiliated groups, I mean the, those, those separate, in, what, what are the, the groups that really want to get control, philosophical control of the court, and they range from the left and the right and somewhere in the middle, they're, they're all over the, the spectrum. Uh, so when I use that, that, that uh, term, they are unaffiliated, they're not authorized by the candidates. In fact, the candidates are not allowed, not permitted uh, to have any contact with the messages of those organizations. <clears throat> Most expensive campaign was in Alabama where the challengers raised $3.8 million and an out-of-state group spent $800,000. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, as, as we know, has been keenly interested in this, in this issue, particularly since she left the Supreme Court. And she recently warned, quote, in too many states, judicial elections are becoming political prize fights where partisans and special interests seek to install judges who will answer to them instead of the law and the Constitution. When did this phenomenon begin? Has it always been with us? Um, most observers say the tipping point came in 2000. In the 2000 elections, uh, when Supreme Court candidates in several states raised a record of $45.6 million, a 61% increase over the previous election cycle. The 2000 elections were not isolated incidents, unfortunately, in Supreme Court races between 1999 and 2008. Candidates raised more than $157 million. Candidates' committees raised that. More than two and a half times the amount was raised, that was raised in a similar period between 1991 and 1998. 
New fundraising records have been established in 15 of the 20 states that hold contested Supreme Court elections. And these totals do not include the ads paid for by the third party, the, the unauthorized uh, campaigns. Uh, so you can see there's a tremendous amount of money being spent to, to elect fair and impartial judges. Spending by outside groups is difficult to tabulate because for most of this period, unauthorized campaigns were not required to report their donors or their expenditures. But according to Justice at Stake, outside groups spent $27.3 million on television advertisements in just four states, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, between 99 and the year 2006. Much of the money, as I said, is spent on TV advertisements. That, those, that's where the expensive uh, expenditures are. In 2000, ads ran in fewer than one quarter of the states with contested Supreme Court elections. That, percent, that percentage quickly grew, and in the 2006 campaigns, advertisements aired in 90% of the states that had contested Supreme Court races. Uh, by the way, um, Ohio holds the record, not, a, not, not one which I like to tout, but I seem I need to disclose it here, airing more judicial campaign <coughs> ads since 1999 than any other state. With a population of only 11 million, we have nine TV markets, which makes, of course, campaigning statewide very expensive. In the 2000 election, five candidates for the House Supreme Court raised $3.3 million, but it was the unauthorized campaigns, which is the trend that set the tone that year, spending an estimated $2.7 million. It was the first time, it was a, this was the first phenomenon for us. One ad featured large, large bundles, some of you have seen these at other conferences, large bundles of, of cash tipping the scales of justice to suggest that the vote of a justice who was running for re-election could be bought with campaign donations. Um, and then the, the ad closed with, is justice for sale in Ohio, kind of a broad brush against all seven of the justices. The campaign earned uh, the moniker of the poster child of how not to select uh, judges. We've been surpassed, I think, uh, fortunately. Well, maybe not fortunately, but uh, we've been surpassed. Since Ohio has required third party campaigns to report donor names, and we're one of the only states that does this, we were able to convince the General Assembly to adopt legislation that now requires, since 2004, uh, the contributors to the unaffiliated campaigns to report their contributions and, to those, and for those contributions to be reported. We've had no negative unauthorized TV advertising since 2004. And the theory was, I think it's been proven, that if, if a donor to, for instance, to a, a Chamber of Commerce PAC uh, makes, makes a donation to elect judges that he or she thinks would be philosophically at least not unfriendly to them, uh, and their name didn't, it used to be their name didn't appear any, <clears throat> appear any place. They could do this uh, with reckless abandon. Now their name appears in a public record. And so we think that's one reason that uh, the ads are, have been only positive ads since 2004. Judicial campaigns in Illinois are described as distressingly expensive following a Supreme Court campaign in 2004 in which the two candidates raised a record of $9.3 million. In Florida, campaign spending by trial judges doubled between 2000 and 2002. And in Los Angeles, I've, I've, that's there, this, is a, uh, this is the phenomenon that's, that's now occurring that this high uh, uh, fundraising and some of the negative advertising, I've emphasized Supreme Court races, but it's been trickling down. And in Florida, and I understand in Los Angeles, there was a race, $500,000, I think, spent in a, in a trial court uh, race in which uh, there were uh, that were negative ads, apparently. In the 2006 campaign for the Supreme Court of Washington, 1,081 ads appeared in uh, contests for just two seats on the Supreme Court, and not a single ad was paid for by a candidate committee. They were all, the spending was all from non-authorized, unauthorized campaigns. Three special interest groups there paid for all the ads, which were typically negative and not particularly interested in the facts. One of the, one of the, thank you, one of the, uh, 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 factors in this is that sometimes the, the message of the unauthorized campaign is contrary to the message of the candidate. That was exactly the case in our 2000 race in, in Ohio in 2000. In, in 2000. Uh, the negative campaign was actually helping uh, the uh, na name identification and therefore the t vote total of the candidate against whom the ads were run. Well, I think that I, have, I do have a little twinkle of a light in, in, in my tunnel there. Uh, Chief Justice Durham. By and large, voters do reject negative campaigns. 
In only a few instances have outside groups been able to unseat a sitting justice. Now that wasn't until this year, uh, where a high number of encumbered justices, as you know, I've referred to, were defeated this year, though. Yeah, I think it's too early to say uh, whether that's a, a, a trend. Um, Democrats uh, had, for instance, failed to unseat three Republican justices in, um, in Texas who were running for re-election, all for re-election, and Tom Phillips informs me that the ads were somewhat negative. I think the voters understand the importance of an impartial judiciary. I think they instinctively know that many of the issues raised in negative campaigns have little if nothing to do with the judge's ability to preside over cases. What troubles voters is the growing need for contributions to judicial campaigns. Nearly every survey concludes that three out of four people surveyed believe that the need to raise campaign contributions affects the decision of judges. Now that's in direct conflict with the very premise of our system, obviously. According to one survey, one in four judges believes that they have an effect, not on them, but on somebody else in their court, in their, in the, in the courthouse. Um, that concern is shared by former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Since her, give me a one minute signal to get, since her retirement, Justice O'Connor, as I mentioned, has sponsored a series of national conferences to draw attention to the need for ensuring the independence, impartiality of the judiciary. The number one recommendation of the first conference, which was, which was three years ago this October, education. Educating primary and secondary school students, but just as importantly, educating American citizens, adults, that the purpose of a court in a constitutional democracy is to serve as a place for the peaceful, fair resolution of disputes. It's not to serve the particular interests of any person or organized group of citizens or the government. The more knowledgeable people are about the role of the courts, according to research by Justice at State campaign, the more likely they are to reject efforts to limit the authority of the judiciary and to support the historic mission of our courts. So, as long as our citizens expect, indeed demand, that courts in our country be impartial, free from inappropriate influence, it seems to me it's likely that courts will continue to be impartial. Our system of laws and constitutions is only as strong, as we know, as the trust extended to it and to them uh, by those who are governed. But that trust is fragile. It is fragile. It's made ever more each time, more fragile each time a misleading campaign ad is aired with each effort to influence judicial decisions through contributions and with each new record amount spent in judicial campaigns. We should reduce the role of fundraising in judicial campaigns. We should make clear to all that judges are accountable to the laws and constitutions of our country. We must ensure, we must ensure the integrity of the judicial process in our country. And finally, I thank you for this conference and for the, uh, your patience in letting me share my views. Thank you. I want to talk to you briefly about another aspect uh, of judicial politics that has changed in recent years, and that is uh, decisions all within this decade from the United States Supreme Court and other state and federal courts which find a First Amendment right of judges to express their views on issues generally and on, in some instances, on issues that may come before their court and a First Amendment right of voters and others to hear what a candidate for judicial office has to say. Let me step back a little bit and, and put the importance of these cases in some context. Uh, we've had elected judges in most states in America for 150 years. They were kind of a reaction to a feeling that legislatures and governors were using judges as political payoffs or jobs for relatives who couldn't make it in the uh, free market, uh, and for about a hundred and something of those 150 years, these elections were about as exciting as a game of checkers over the telephone. Uh, they were nearly always unopposed, or if they were opposed, uh, kind of a Marcus of Queensbury set of rules tended to prevail. Uh, in 1924, the American Bar Association, prodded by Chief Justice Taft, passed some rules of aspiration for judges about how they were to behave. Uh, what they were to do and not do, and among those were rules about judges not talking about cases, not promising that they would view the law one way or another before they had actually heard the parties arguing. 
In the wake of World War II, uh, and the good government movements after World War II, uh, judicial qualifications commissions and conduct commissions were started in nearly every state around the nation, and uh, they needed some guidelines for judicial conduct in order to properly discipline a judge, so they started using these, these uh, canons which uh, in 1972 were promulgated uh, into a code by the American Bar Association called the Code of Judicial Conduct. And rather than being aspirational, they started using words like shall. Uh, nearly every state has now, through, generally through the Supreme Court in the exercise of its inherent power, has adopted a code of judicial conduct that is modeled either entirely or largely over on what the American Bar Association promulgated. And the ABA has come out with two subsequent revisions in 1990 and 2007 to take, event, uh, to take account of changing times and mores and also of some legal decisions uh, with this code. But still broadly, what this code says is that you trade something for putting on that robe and sitting on the dais and, and getting a guaranteed salary, uh, and that is uh, you trade your right to pop off about anything you want to. You trade your right to act like a legislator in robes, and instead you hold forth to the public a promise that you will be fair and impartial, that you'll listen to what each side has to say before you make a ruling, uh, and that you will recognize that a uh, judge is not a legislator, that you do have a different function. Now, that's the genius of this code. So, as uh, Tom has explained, 15, 20 years ago, some groups started realizing that judges had a lot of power, and they started pouring money into these otherwise fairly boring races uh, for courts around the nation. And, and I could go into this in more detail of time for me, but we think Texas was where it all started. Uh, but California certainly came along real strong in the Rose Bird fight, uh, the, the uh, uh, merit retention battles, retention election battles in 1986. These money contests were very interesting because they're almost entirely a fight between the personal injury trial bar on one hand and business groups on the other. And ordinarily, they are a fight about which judicial candidate is softest on crime. Uh, but those were out there. Independent expenditures were being made. Uh, the judges still had this code. They were still running on, you know, who went to the best law school and had tried the most cases and had the largest family and taught the most Sunday school classes. Uh, somewhat more recently, about 10 or 12 years ago, some social issue groups discovered that the kinds of cases, questions that judges were looking at were some of the hot button issues that could get their voters out. Uh, and so groups started talking about this judge is, is soft on abortion, uh, same-sex marriage, gun rights. These things played right into their hands. Uh, these groups didn't buy multi-million dollar television ads as much as they used slate cards and now with the internet, uh, fax, uh, they communicate within their own network. It's sometimes, I think you can go through a whole campaign and not even know that a large campaign is being run against you because as Governor Perry of our state says, these groups communicate by smoke signals uh, somewhat invisibly. But that's going on out there. Chief Justice Shepard of Indiana calls that uh, the judges being roadkill on the highway to larger objectives that groups have. Still, judges were... Uh, were isolated from some of this. They would get asked questions by groups. Uh, will you vote this way if, you're, uh, if we endorse you, put you on our slate card? And they would normally say, hey, hey, I can't tell you. If I could tell you, I couldn't sit in your case. So that's the status of things in 2002, when the White case, halfway through, I now get to my point, when the White case was decided by the Supreme Court of the United States. This was a challenge brought by an unsuccessful candidate for uh, the Supreme Court of Minnesota to three parts of Minnesota's Code of Judicial Conduct. And the Supreme Court of the United States only agreed to hear one of those challenges, and that was on something called the Announce Clause, which said that candidates for judicial office shall not announce their views on, on public issues that are in dispute. 
That was not part of the ABA's 1990 code. It was an obsolete provision, and Minnesota had not gotten around to revamping its code. So it was around in only nine states. The Supreme Court, on a five to four vote, struck that provision down as violating free speech. It's a little unclear about who's free speech, whether the candidates or the people who were trying to get a commitment from the candidate, uh, but it was a Justice Scalia Jesuitical opinion, I think it's fair to say, uh, that recognized there was an important and perhaps compelling state interest in the judiciary being impartial and being seen as impartial, but came up with all kinds of reasons why the fit was not tight enough here between this announce clause uh, and uh, the goals that the state professed to be uh, trying to achieve with it. The court sent back to the Eighth Circuit uh, the candidates challenged to two other provisions of the code, which were really, I think, more important. One was a challenge that kept this candidate from identifying with a political party because Minnesota wants nonpartisan judges. And he wanted to say he was a Republican and the Republican Party endorsed him. And the other was a challenge that kept him from soliciting money in person in order to fund his own campaign. And I can tell you as, as a... Uh, veteran of races in a state where you can raise your own money, I think you tend to do better asking for it yourself uh, than having a committee maybe send out a letter and maybe people look at it and, and send money in. Uh, and so he wanted the advantages of that. And the Eighth Circuit went along with him entirely on the political party issue and said you could ask for money in large groups, undefined, uh, and the solicitation clause violated the Constitution to that extent. Linda Greenhouse of the New York Times said the Supreme Court of the United States was sure to take this case and review it. And at full disclosure here, I was the lawyer for the state of Minnesota. It's comforting or not, depending on your perspective, to know that the Supreme Court of the United States does not read the New York Times and follow it <laughs> invariably, uh, because they did not take that case. Uh, and in the wake of this victory, a number of other cases, 34 now to date, have been filed around the country, principally in federal court, and challenging various parts of the code. And in federal district court, these cases have been almost uniformly successful. And in a number of states, uh, provisions that prevent judges from committing to a particular point of view during uh, campaign speech have been struck down. Provisions that prevent judges from making pledges or promises about their performance in office have been struck down. The solicitation clause has been struck down in its entirety, not just uh, uh, solicitation to small groups, but you can ask anybody for money. And one state, uh, Wisconsin, a district court struck down the recusal rules, which says that if a sitting judge in the course of some prior statement had committed to ruling in a particular way in a case, then that was grounds for uh, the party who was <laughs> not going to fare too well to make a motion for recusal. The judge said that was just a backhanded way uh, of limiting the free speech of the candidates. Not surprisingly, these cases have not done as well in state court where Really, I've only seen the state of Arkansas willing to rule that its own rule that it wrote was void for vagueness, in part. Uh, and somewhat more surprisingly and encouragingly, these opinions have not done as well at the circuit level. Not on the merits. The circuit, we have yet to have a circuit say, no, the, the rights of a fair and impartial judiciary and one that appears that way to the public are so important that these rules can withstand muster. But we have had these cases thrown out on ripeness, standing grounds. Uh, interesting, uh, two courts have said, well, the group, some of these cases have been bought by groups like Wisconsin's for abortions rights, we'll say. And two cases have said those groups have a right to ask questions, but there's no incohate free speech right to hear speech unless there's somebody that wants to give speech. And unless you have a judicial candidate like the man in Minnesota who, said, who brings a lawsuit saying, I want to say something and the law prohibits me from doing it, then the, the frustrated listeners of non-speech don't have any standing to sue. So through these procedural devices, 
the effects of these cases are not too widespread yet. But the groups, main, and mainly it's the social issue groups who want more commitment from judges, are using the White case and its progeny to say, if we're going to endorse you, we want judges in the arena. When I first ran for office, I would go to some of these groups and try to get their endorsement and say, oh, you know, all I can promise you is that I'll try to do a good job. Sometimes that was good enough for them. They just wanted a longer slate card and they'd put my name on. Most, most of the time it wasn't, but they weren't endorsing my opponent either. Uh, now these slate cards are very important in some races, particularly in a local race. Uh, in some of our large counties in Texas, it looks like more than half the primary voters will vote for a slate card. So there gets to be a lot of pressure and a race to the bottom. And they say, look, you've got the white case here. You can answer our question. You answer our question, our slate card goes to 400,000 people. Well, some folks start answering it. Uh, and then they win the race. And so others start answering it. So there's been a lot of pressure on our candidates, particularly at the local level, to either give direct answers or by a wink and a nod, uh, give an indication of where they might be on the great issues of life. And the groups have gotten a lot bolder. I can give you one particular example. The Concerned Gun Owners of America used to have a very aggressive questionnaire. And for legislative and executive candidates, they wanted to know exactly where you stood on the Second Amendment, exactly what it allowed and what it prohibited in terms of gun ownership. For judges, when I ran, they asked softer questions like, and these are real questions, how many deer heads do you have mounted in your house? <laughs> how many times have you taken your kid to target practice in the last month? And they kind of got a sense of where you were on their issues, but no commitments. Now they have a, a unitary questionnaire for legislative and executive candidates. The danger in this is, is very obvious. Taken with what Tom has talked about, the massive expenditures by independent groups, not subject, mostly not even subject to telling you who they are, and certainly not subject to any type of restrictions on their free speech rights to twist, distort, magnify uh, anything they want. Taken with that, and then with the increasing pressure from judges to play along, uh, in order to get the support of and contributions from groups who do have a very intense interest in the outcome of, of uh, certain judicial decisions. There is a huge race to the bottom that we see uh, in some of these state court elections. Uh, and so monitoring these decisions uh, as the white someday Sarah Lane in the New York Times got to be right. The Supreme Court is going to have to take another white case. Monitoring those cases, getting involved in them, writing amicus briefs, I think is one of the most important things that concerned members of the bar can do. Because 80% plus of our judges are in some type of election, retention, nonpartisan, partisan. Uh, judges are going to be important in our society. They're not going to just go back to start, you know, to deciding landlord tenant disputes. They're going to be involved in the hot button social issues uh, of our time and generations to come. And if we want this great promise of an independent judiciary, which has been the crown jewel of the American system, uh, and we want that to apply in our state courts, which have 98% of the judicial business, as well as in our federal courts, uh, then we're going to have to see that this issue comes out right, and that the proper balance is struck between the relationship between a voter and a candidate, and the realization that judges are different than other officials. Thank you. Thank you. I think what uh, Tom Moyer on, on my left and Tom Phillips on my right have laid out is, is in some respects a perfect storm in terms of going forward with this notion of the American judiciary and the American courts, and particularly the state courts, as, as Tom put it, the crown jewel of American democracy. Uh, the issues relating to judicial independence and impartiality have uh, two components in some respects. One, of course, is decisional independence, the, uh, which overlaps with impartiality, the ability to come to an individual case, uh, able to decide that case on no influences other than uh, the law and the facts. And then there's the issue of systemic 
independence, the degree to which the existence of the judicial branch ensures that the rule of law uh, can be maintained in our system. I think it, it is true we've had judicial selections for well over 100 years. When they were first introduced, they were considered a populist reform and embraced by outsiders as a way to ensure that the judiciary was, in fact, transparent and free of corruption. Uh, something has happened in the last decade or a little more. And one of the chief impacts of what has happened, as has been detailed for us here today, is the impact on the perception of fairness and on the public's trust and confidence in the judiciary. Uh, if I could just elaborate very briefly on some of what you've already heard. Um, as Chief Justice Moyer pointed out, three in four, a little over 76% of Americans agreed in a 2001 poll that campaign cash influences judicial decision making. In Illinois, that number was 87% in a similar poll. And in Pennsylvania, it was over 90%. 90% of, uh, of Pennsylvanians thought that cash contributions affected judicial decision making. In Texas, 83% of all adults surveyed said they, that they believed campaign contributions influenced judicial decisions either very or fairly significantly. And that number included in Texas, which I think was very distressing, 69% of court personnel and 79% of the attorneys surveyed. <laughs> then you get to um, the trial judges in Texas in this same study. Uh, even 48% of Texas judges in that particular study around 2001 admitted that they believed money had an impact on judicial decisions. And in 2002, the Justice at Stake Project, which Justice Moyer mentioned, did a study of about 2,500 state court judges. So it was just surveying judges. And fully 50% of the respondents in that survey conceded that, quote, campaign donations influenced their decisions at least some of the time. Now, one doesn't know in what fashion that influence uh, played out, and was, one doesn't know how extensive it was. Nonetheless, that's a very troubling uh, statistic. Just a couple of other, uh, I, I, I wanted to point out, we're talking about judicial elections here today and the campaign process uh, that has accompanied judicial elections, but there are other things that are going on, and unfortunately, although you in California haven't had to deal with too many of them, you tend to export some of them to other states. I've forgotten his name, but a California entrepreneur um, with way too much money in his pocket went to South Dakota three years ago and helped to hire um, an entity which assisted him in securing a significant number of votes to put an initiative on the South Dakota ballot. They called it Jail for Judges. It was the Judicial um, Accountability Initiative Law. And it, pr it would have provided, it was a, an initiative to amend the, California, the uh, South Dakota Constitution. It would have provided for the creation of a lay review board uh, which could review any judicial decision from any court in the state, reverse that decision, and in the process impose criminal and civil penalties on the judges who entered those decisions. Now, thanks to a very effective campaign in South Dakota, it went down. And I think some of us have been very relieved at the time its proponents uh, were proposing to take it nationwide. It has not popped up again uh, this year, so we are hopeful uh, that, m that maybe the individual in question lost enough money in the stock market that he's not going to be financing these campaigns anymore. There's always some silver lining to everything. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the other phenomena that is exerting pressure on independence and impartiality is the term limit notion for judges. Colorado has had to fight off uh, a couple of initiatives over the last several years trying to impose term limits on specifically the Supreme Court, clearly with an effort to revamp the court. Uh, and I also just wanted to mention the Michigan race, which has been alluded to. The Wall Street Journal did an article last week suggesting that the Chief Justice of Michigan, who lost his election, may actually have lost in response to public negative responses to the heavy business contributions and advertising he was 
he was receiving. It's, it's not clear because those results haven't been thoroughly studied yet. So this is playing out in all kinds of unexpected ways, but I think the bottom line is it's very disturbing. And I think we are at a point in time where we who are concerned about the future of American uh, democracy and the rule of law have to start thinking about state courts as institutions and talking about the institutional responses that we can make to these kinds of attacks and threats. I'm just going to talk about some of the approaches that have emerged, but I, I want, as I mention individual items, I want you to keep in mind this notion that they need, that the responses to these kinds of pressures and attacks need to be systemic and systematic. State courts and those who support them, um, and the federal courts as well, although we tend to think they're a little whiny when they start talking about judicial independence because of life tenure, inspector generals notwithstanding. Uh, really, in some respects, the state courts are where it's at, and it's worth repeating uh, what Tom Phillips said a moment ago about the fact that 98% of the judicial business in the United States takes place in state courts, and uh, Chief Justice George is fond of reminding us in the conference that California has the largest judicial system in the world. So this is very real to those of you um, who live and work here. The kinds of responses uh, that have been evolving, some of them have been in place for a considerable period of time. Tom mentioned uh, judicial conduct commissions and the notion of, uh, of ensuring compliance with established codes of conduct. Those have been in place and are relatively non-controversial. I think there's a related, uh, a related phenomenon associated with conduct uh, commissions that I'd like to just mention because I'm aware from some recent press that it's, it's a, a, an issue of some controversy here in the state of California and that has to do with judicial elections. I'm sorry, with judicial education. If you are going to impose on judges uh, codes of behavior and you're going to sanction them for failure to comply with those codes of behavior, it seems to me that as a system you incur some responsibility to educate them about standards for their performance and to give them the educational tools uh, and the substantive tools that they will need to do their, judge, their job of judging appropriately. Uh, I've been a champion of judicial education all of my life, but I'm aware that here in California there's, actually, there's a phenomenon wherein the trial judges themselves are resisting the notion of mandatory judicial education uh, on the notion, I think misguided, that it will in some way impinge negatively on their independence and impartiality. My notion is precisely the opposite, that judges need all of the information, training, skill development, professional development opportunities they can get in order to protect themselves against attacks that they are either incompetent or uh, unprepared to do their jobs. Oh, by the way, I, I meant before I started in to talk about institutional responses to comment on what I think is, for the time being at least, a failed reform effort. And that is the effort to move from judicial elections to um, so-called merit selection with retention elections. We happen to have that system in our state. We're one of only, um, I think it's 11 states in the country that has pure merit selection and retention. I think it's wonderful. I think everyone else should have it. But I can tell you that no state has moved from judicial elections to merit selection, I think, in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, the American Judicature Society had a sustained campaign to reform judicial selection to move to merit selection. And about f somewhere in the last five to 10 years, they've, they haven't, I'm sure they wouldn't say they've abandoned it, but they are now focused on reforming the election process and reforming the campaign process. And I think that's a tacit recognition of the fact that there is no political will in this country in those states which have judicial elections to change the process. So talked about conduct codes, talked about judicial education, campaign finance reform is uh, an idea with considerable promise. As far as I know, the state of North Carolina is the only state to have adopted by legislation a public financing system. I believe it applies only at the appellate court level. It's been in place for three or four years now, and so far as I know, it's, it, it is considered by North Carolinians, at least, to be highly successful. 
that's an idea which other state courts around the country are watching and to the extent uh, that problems are starting to surface here in California, it's something that might have some appeal. Uh, another response is one that's also been mentioned as Tom was talking, talking about um, some of the litigation is, uh, is beefing up the recusal rules. Now, it's not going to do any good to beef them up if federal courts then knock them down, although I, I have to admit, I'm sure I read that opinion at one point in time. It is just unfathomable to me that a federal judge could conclude, that any judge could conclude that a rule which required a judge who was biased uh, to be unable to be removed from the hearing in the case, it is unfathomable to me. And uh, we just had an email, or Tom had an email from a mutual acquaintance suggesting that the Massey Cole case, uh, which somebody mentioned, I can't remember who mentioned it. You mentioned it. Not by name, but I mentioned it. Yeah, the Mass, that's the uh, West Virginia case in which uh, two of the at least two of the members of the Supreme Court took significant contributions from one of the parties in a piece of litigation. Oh, my gosh. I just got the three-minute warning. Um, it has appealed, one of, one of the parties has appealed on due process grounds to the United States Supreme Court, and word today is that the court may have taken it. It's been a matter of some speculation. They have had the petition for cert under advisement for far longer than they ordinarily do, and if, if they've decided to take it, that may be an interesting um, development in that area. Um, I also want to talk about judicial performance evaluation and voter education. If we are to succeed from the perspective of the state courts, in responding effectively to the attacks on independence and impartiality, I think one of the things we will have to do is to establish ourselves as responsible for accountability and transparency about our work. And to that end, I think uh, conduct review, judicial education, um, and judicial performance evaluation are going to be very, a very important part of our campaign to be responsive along with judicial performance evaluation is going to have to go effective voter education, uh, which a number of states currently have in place. Not only is it important for us to be doing judicial, judicial performance evaluation in terms of the way judges do their jobs, and I'm talking about um, independent standards having to do the, with the qualities of good judging, not, not performance evaluation tied to the outcome of particular cases. I'm also talking about court performance standards. The National Center for State Courts has recently published, and a number of states, including ours around the country, are implementing what they call core tools, which relate to ways to measure access to the courts, timeliness of decision making, quality of public service. I think that all of us in the state courts are going to have to embrace these kinds of performance measures, uh, not only for our own self-improvement, but for publication and access by the public so that they know uh, how we're doing our jobs. And finally, as uh, Tom Moyer concluded his remarks, I'd like to emphasize as well the notion that the judiciary is going to have to step up in a very effective way in the area of public and civic education and in doing judicial outreach. There are, uh, There is a movement in many states around the country to establish uh, civic education commissions, the judiciaries, and many states have been active in those, and I think we're going to have to embrace that work. And then finally, let me end, well, it's going to say something about empirical research. We need more of it, and we need to share more about it. And let me just close by throwing out an idea from uh, my friend, uh, former member of the Oregon Supreme Court and law professor, Hans Lindy. Hans has written a couple of very interesting essays on the federal constitution's guarantee of a Republican form of government. And he has this notion that the uh, that portion of the guarantee clause forms a textual basis for and affirmation of the rule of law, that without an independent, impartial judiciary to enforce um, constitutional values, you cannot have the rule of law. He thinks, and I think it's an intriguing idea, we're not there yet, but someday we may be looking at constitutional litigation, not only around the due process clause, but around the guarantee clause. Um, he thinks that the clause may provide a legal basis for invalidating any institutional feature 
of judicial selection or retention that undermines the independence of state courts to administer the rule of law. I'll just throw that grenade on his behalf. Thank you very much. What we would uh, plan to do now is uh, to ask the participants, our, 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 uh, our three speakers, to exchange some views, ask some questions, offer some comments, and, and uh, uh, it says here that the moderator can say something too. So I, I just, I, I'm like all of us here, been listening very carefully to a sad story. Uh, if you uh, have white on the books, which greatly limits restrictions on what judicial candidates can say and do, how about fairly substantial restrictions on campaign contributions? Um, if they work for, uh, for political elections, it seems to me that they ought to work, that is, they should be valid for judicial elections as well. But go ahead. Uh, well, there's a lot of people that are interested in these races, and money's going to flow somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the idea that if you just don't give the candidates any money, uh, everything will be fine is, is very misguided unless you raise the qualifications for who can run in the first place, because these are low salience elections. Uh, and I do think that if you are running for office and you think your opponent is unqualified and mad, bad, and dangerous to know, there's some obligation to try to, to educate the public. Uh, some of the western states, as well as North Carolina, uh, go with, as you all do in California, have voter guides. Of course, you all had the bright idea of charging $100,000 to get in the voter guide in the largest counties, but they're free in every other state. and. Uh, Howard Baker, the former senator from Tennessee, has been crusading for years for a bill that would give a free federal franc to that voting guideline. And of course, with the internet, uh, you can communicate that as well. Uh, public financing has just been started in New Mexico, too. Just at the, and that's a small state, just at the appellate court level. But I do think that, uh, as Christine said, that bears watching closely, uh, but I think Anonymous elections don't serve anybody very well, and so the challenge we have is how to have an election where the candidate can give the message out, not just groups writing in and saying things that may or not, may not be true, uh, so that a, a person who's interested in casting an informed vote can do so without raising so much money to inform the voters from people with a direct interest in the case, in your cases, that you leave yourself open to charges that you're bought or you've been biased. And, and that's a very tough uh, needle to thread. Mm -hmm. I could give a, a, bit of a, a bit of a counterpoint to uh, my friend Tom Phillips um, to the contribution. Uh, we, we had, in, Ohio, in Ohio, we adopted contribution limits in the mid-1990s, I guess it was. Um, and for a while, uh, then we didn't have we didn't have these unauthorized campaigns. And for a while, we had I had considerable comfort in knowing that because there were limits on individual contributions, limits on political party contributions, and at law firms. Um, and and uh, it gave us a good bit of comfort because we didn't really have to worry much about recusal, except in the obvious situations that don't relate to fundraising. But one of the arguments made now against contribution limits is that has forced that that phenomenon has forced uh, money into the into the third party or the, the un, un, unauthorized campaigns I'm not sure that's true because um, I think well, I think there is some truth to it but I think the bright the bright spot is except for for this you know the removal of several justices uh, justices from Supreme courts this year with negative campaigns I think the bright spot is that if if people who contribute to the unauthorized campaigns know their name is going to be publicly filed, that is a great disincentive for them to contribute to a campaign if they know it's going to be a negative, a very strongly negative campaign. We've, we found, we don't have any empirical data, but we found that, that that is what has happened. And so I think contribution limits are still, are still worthy. Uh, there are some who think that, that uh, the most important most dramatic thing one can do, or helpful thing one can do, is just simply have uh, have very, very precise and frequent uh, public reporting during the campaign season of, of contributions. So right up to the campaign time, you know exactly 
who is contributing to each person's campaign. The problem is the public doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to that unless somebody gathers it and puts it before them and uses it somehow. And, and I'm for limits, too. I, I think I probably overread Jesse's question. Talk about very low limits. Uh, we have limits in Texas, and uh, everyone on our court backed them. And they were, they were a vast difference from what some candidates had done before the limits were imposed. But I don't know if they're low enough that the public would say, gee, with just $5,000 caps on contribution, there's no way that person could be influenced. Well, I want to thank our three visiting Chief Justices very much. We uh, appreciate uh, both the, uh, the, the, the wisdom and the content of what you've had to tell us, and uh, who knows, maybe there will be some improvement in uh, what, what is a, a terribly serious problem for the administration of justice in this country. Thank you all very much. Thank you.